Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis. I'm your host, Deacon Jonathan Stord, joined by my co-host, Jason Memel. Hello, Jason. Hello there. Hello. So, uh, great show to go along with our, our October spooktacular uh, programming. Uh, we're doing sort of extra looking at, at uh, the occult uh, themes and horror themes and Nazi themes in horror fiction in all of its different forms, be that movies, video games, or gaming. So we have, uh, is it is Petr Nalo? I, I, didn't, I don't even know how to say your name. That sounds perfect. <laughs> uh, a, a, lot of, a lot of Americans call me Peter. Okay. It, it's, it, it is the same origin, it's just a different spelling. Here's... Perfect, perfect. So so we have uh, Peter, we have Peter from uh, Cult Divinity Lost, uh, the, the reboot of the popular tabletop uh, role-playing game that has a lot of, uh, we see a lot of Gnostic themes in it. Um, and uh, to the point that, uh, that, that the Gnostic Wisdom Network, the, the people who bring you talk Gnosis, have started doing live streams of, of a scenario of a game um so right now it's sort of a new thing but i'm going to do a plug for that really quick but um if you go to our i'm trying to bring it up twitch tv twitch.tv slash gnostic wisdom uh, at the second and last wednesday of the month we are uh, we're doing the stream there, uh, but right now it's a new thing. So that schedule's kind of all over the place. We're still experimenting with it. We're missing some nights. Uh, I'm not directly involved, but it, it's really cool stuff. So uh, it is something that we want to get going regular. The response has been really good. So definitely tune in to uh, watch a really amazing team with some really amazing creative scenarios uh, do some some gnostic role playing. So uh, yeah, so Peter, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, oh, I also have to do a plug for uh, our Patreon. Uh, Jason, I, I'll just do it. We'll we'll do the contest next time. It's patreon.com okay. slash Gnostic. <laughs> We're, we need money to do the show. We can't do it without it. I wish it wasn't that way. Uh, but if you like the show, uh, uh, please donate for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month. Uh, you can put a cap on that uh, in case you're, you're worried about how much we're going to run through the Patreon. We generally do about five to six to seven max. Right now, five or six pieces of media. We actually do a lot that's bonus. So, for instance, the Cult uh, stream. The, we're not charging for that on Patreon. The Black Iron Prison series that we do is not being charged on Patreon. Our new uh, monthly panel series, Talking Not system is not going through the patreon so you're getting something like 10 or 20 pieces of content that you're helping to bring out to the world and only a handful of those are actually being paid you can also do one-time donations at patreon.com slash gnostic also tell people about the show uh like rate subscribe all that good stuff if you're unable to help us out financially just you know take this episode you like tabletop role-playing games probably if you're watching this app you know, take this episode, send it to your best friend and say, one, check out this great podcast, video show, whatever you want to call us. Two, you know, we got to start playing cult. So, okay. Thank you for your patience, Peter. Uh, Jason, you, you're sort of the RPG uh, uh, expert here. Uh, take it away. Oh, you're muted. Uh, I will. Uh, this is also where I'll maybe take a moment to remind anyone who hasn't heard this story that um, I actually counter Gnosticism through Dungeons and Dragons, uh, uh, through uh, a friend of mine who um, uh, was running a D&D game set in our real history, and he decided to use the Nag Hammadi Codex as like a reference point for some for some uh, mysterious stuff. Uh, he himself isn't even a, uh, a person who's deeply interested in Gnosticism, but he thought the text was cool, and, and then I thought the text was cool. I started Googling, and you know, many other things happening later, here I am, um, talking about Gnosticism online. Um, uh, so I think there is a kind of a neat circle here. Um, and uh, I, I, I will get into talking or the, the D comparison. I want to bring that up here soon. But uh, Petr, just, just so that anyone who's tuning in who doesn't already know about cult uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as a world, as a game, sort of game uh, environment, could you give us like the trapped in the eternal elevator pitch of the game and uh, this, the universe that it describes? Yes. Uh, I, I can also say that actually, I mean, Cult was released in 1991 uh, and uh, it, I was 14 at the time. So it was my first encounter with Gnosticism as well. I had never heard anything about that. So, so uh, 
it uh, it was a very an, a door opener for me, but it's also a lot of inspiration, uh, mainly like uh, Neil Gaiman and Clive Barker and all that that sort of weird urban fantasy horror. But it's a horror role playing game uh, aimed for an adult audience. I think that's important to point out. Um, it's it's urban. It's set in our world in our time. In a, I mean, you can play it in the fifties or in the eighties, but it's set in in a, in our world and we aim for today to play today and you portray people that are sort of with broken pasts and, and dark secrets that live in live in our world that have started to notice that things are not really what they seem that there are some things that most people don't even recognize that there are seems to be existence as a world beyond ours that in our dreams we might we may reach other places that there are creatures among us that can't be said are human and that there is this sort of illusion, this veil that that covers everything and also our souls. And most of the people in our world are, are, are sort of sleepwalking. We are we are sleeping, but some some have started to wake up and have sort of started to notice that these strange things happening and things from our own past come back to haunt us. And uh, the further you go into the game and you sort of unveil uh, the mythology, you will realize that you are in this prison that that uh, we are kept in and where we sort of live, die, uh, are reborn again in an endless construct that is a, a sort of an old ancient machinery that was created by the demiurge that... that uh, now and, and in the in the mythology of cult, the demiurge is gone, and the machinery is slowly fa falling apart. So it's like a urban horror in our modern world with uh, a, a god that is gone, uh, a crumbling illusion, ancient power, sort of remnants of the demiurge that sort of tries to uh, mend the broken system to keep mankind and our divine souls asleep. Yeah. I would say that is sort of a. Oh, I was just about to say for everybody out there who's not familiar with cults, but you're probably listening to or watching the show because they have an interest in Gnosticism. You know, ding, ding, ding. You just described <laughs> the uh, <laughs> problem with you know the entire the entire belief system in many ways, um, and, uh, and and the many themes that that we like to talk about on the show. You know, and it's interesting. Now I know people watch the show. They see me and Jason. They're like, "There's two cool guys, stereotypical masculine cool guys." But <laughs> the, you're going to be surprised by this. But we're kind of nerdy and have always been so. So you know. We too kind of discovered Gnosticism, Gnostic themes through stuff like D and D, Final Fantasy VII, uh, uh, the work of Neil Gaiman, the work of Alan Moore, the work of Grant Morrison, Philip K. Dick. So it, it is, uh, uh, you know, in a, in a course, I'm also speaking to people who. You know, we're, we're actually Gnostics, or our people listening to the show are actually Gnostics, but there's lots of people who watch and listen to the show who would not call themselves a Gnostic, who have no beliefs like that, but find the topic so fascinating. There's just a psychological hook there. And, and of course, it's great for, for telling stories, and, and it sounds like it works incredibly well with, with, the, uh, with the cult setup. Um, so now, see, Jason, I don't even have any questions. I'm just doing commentary. Go, go for it, Jason. What's your next question? Uh, well, no, I, I was going to get into some of the more game related stuff, but one, one thing maybe just because of the way you described it, uh, that I think is maybe interesting to point out, especially because we're, we're getting right into the, um, uh, the point of, uh, of Gnosticism and its connections is that it feels like cult sort of takes a Gnostic impulse and sort of doubles down on it. Like it's, uh, um, you know, it, uh, not just is the demiurge something that's created the world that we're stuck in, but then uh, the demiurge is now gone and things are even worse, you know, um, uh, which, uh, so I, I, maybe, can you, can you just, can you get, maybe get into that at all? Like this was something I found when, when, uh, reading my way through the book is just how, um, sorry, if anyone can hear that car horn in the background, <laughs> um, uh, that's just the demiurge getting, trying to get my attention. Um, but, uh, uh, what is it to, to create, uh, I guess maybe is that, is this why it's an emphasis on it being a horror? Gnostic game, not a not specifically just a uh, say um, um, a cult themed game, but specifically like 
for horror, it needs to double down, is I guess my question? Well, I, I would say that Cult is first and foremost a horror game. I think that's important to remember because you could have a Gnostic game without the elements of horror. And I do think that, I mean, you can play cult in many different ways, in subtle ways and more extreme ways, but cult is a game that is really approaches horror in a way that, that we try to be quite, I mean, we, we love the drama and, and you are, you're not playing the classic heroic characters either. You are playing sort of broken characters with tragic pasts and, and, and I would call you anti anti-heroes. You're not really heroes in that sense. Um, so, so you need to have sort of an acceptance for the genre of horror, I think. And, and, uh, it, I would say it's fairly dark even and, and fairly niche even for horror games in the sense that we really want to explore, you know, things like trauma and, and, and uh, uh, mental illness and all those things in a responsible way. But, it, but it, it is very close to the characters because we want you to dare to portray characters that are, you know, because the, 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 the mind in cult is, the idea in cult is that sort of the more outcast from society you become uh, or the more broken you become also the more of the reality you start to see and society will also start to push you out because you're becoming too weird because you start to see these strange things so i would say that comes first and then we have have the gnostic teams and they are also reinterpreted in a way to sort of fit the mythology for cult i think there are many like pure gnostics that might feel what have you done with the Archons? <laughs> what, what, what is this with the, the Demiurge? He's gone. Uh, where are other? Where are the other parts? Is, is, is it Yahweh or is it something else? What, you know, there, there are things that probably they feel is perhaps a bit off in sort of many classic Gnostic teachings. So I, I just think that the, the horror is sort of the of the core um, core of the experience, and then it, it, the everything around it is sort of. The world is a Gnostic world. It's a real Gnostic world. It's like, this is reality and it's just horror. The, the illusion is falling apart. Mankind is starting to wake up, but it's a painful awakening. And there are powers that tries to stop us from awakening. And we also start to discover sort of fragments of us beyond when mankind actually was, were awakened and in a divine form. Yeah, I don't know if that's a good answer. I feel I ran to the way. Well, no, no, I think that's a great answer. Yeah, um, uh, I think, uh, well, I, I guess I think it, it sort of exposes uh, what I was sort of hoping, where I was hoping you kind of uh, explore or go with us is that, uh, yes, this isn't, um, this isn't an, an attempt to map Gnosticism perfectly. It's a horror game that is involving Gnosticism. Um, uh, although some might say that the that the, the Gnostic worldview means that the world is a horror game, <laughs> um, so there is a uh, there, there is still a connection there, which is really strong. Um, uh, Jonathan, I've got more questions, but is there anything you wanted to respond to there? Oh, just that uh, there is something particular about the horror genre, and this has almost become cliche, you know, due to say like a twenty four, but like trauma and alienation. Right. These these are themes that I that I find the horror genre are p particularly good at exploring and can do so in a unique way. There is something about, you know, the, the terrifyingness of the other, of the supernatural, of the thriller, of the fear that is inherently in the genre of scaring yourself, of being able to construct these elaborate mythologies that really allow you to explore trauma and alienation in ways that I feel other genres can't. So I, I think that's uh, the, you know that's that that's very exciting. So really, just uh, and, and of course, you know, I, I would say those themes are tied up with Gnosticism. But you can sort of, um, you, you know, Gnosticism is, is is a great storytelling uh, engine, and, and and of course, there's more positive interpretations. But uh, it works quite well in sci-fi, and particularly horror, right? And the, just the terror of our existence. Um, as well. <laughs> so. I, I, I... I, I agree. I think one thing that differs, I would say, cult from, I mean, there there are many there are many horror games. And there are many good horror games, but I think that one thing, if you there are like a big one called Call of Cthulhu, of course, that most people know about the Lovecraftian one. But I think that one thing that really differs horror from that is that you know in Cthulhu you have you are 
ordinary people. The more you learn about reality, it's like it's dangerous, you go insane. Uh, but in cult, you are not ordinary people, not really. You are actually divine. The lives we are living, living now are, are unnatural to us. I mean, like paying bills and going to, to a mall, doing these, like, they are, they are part of the illusion. They are part of our sort of physical prison. Uh, so when we learn more about reality, we are going closer, you know, we learn more about the truth. It's about actually sort of ascension. I mean, it's, it's, but it's also a lot about encountering ourselves and encountering our sort of our, our shadow in a sort of Jungian, Jungian sense that we need to encounter our darkness. That's part of, you know, waking up. And uh, again, back to sort of the difference between Call of Cthulhu and a lot of other horror is that in cult, horror is based around the character. When you create a campaign in cult, you build it around the player characters and their dark secrets and their dark past. So it's centered around you and things that comes from your past that come back to haunt your creatures from, you know, that you attract. Uh, so it's not like a, a giant monster in, in a far region of the galaxy. It's, it stems from you, your characters. So this, the, the stories become very personal in that sense that it, it's when you are creating the characters and you're building the campaign, the horror sort of springs from what you have created and the stories, and depending on what dark secrets you choose to uh, pick and are your disadvantages of your characters. And of course, the game master, the horror will be very different and you sort of adapt it to what kind of story you want to tell with that particular group. So. But I think it's a different different uh, aspect that horror comes from within in a different way. And of course, there is a l many worlds outside in the cult mythology. But yeah, um, I think there's like so much richness in what you just described that I think is useful for for how people look at the Gnostic uh, 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 mythologies that exist because there's not even one. There's you know there's so many different uh, like sort of types of Gnosticism out there. Um, that was, yeah, that was great. Um, uh, I was going to try to pick a piece out of it and, and ask about it, but it's just, I think, I'll let the way you described that just sit as its as its own. If you're listening to this as a podcast, rewind and listen to it again and then come back. Um, uh, one thing that you did mention that I think I want to connect to is like, so you talked about how um, in something like Call of Cthulhu, the players live in a normal world and then are exposed to an unnormal world. Uh, um, uh, to 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 the weird, whereas in cult we uh, we're all stuck in it already, and that's it's not a matter of of going and finding it. It's more like a matter of of uncovering it, uncovering what's right underneath. Um, uh, but what I think is also kind of interesting there, you talked about how the players, like the campaign, is focused on on players and their own sort of en enmeshment in the in the the world that we're stuck in. Uh, which I think is also really powerful. This is actually something I think that distinguishes it from games like uh like say even called cthulhu or more like the big sort of famous uh, role-playing game of dungeons and dragons where your character is something that kind of externally works into the world like you go on an adventure you find things you fight things you come back and you become more and more powerful etc um uh, and even the rules are arbitrary, or at least hopefully arbitrary. Like the you roll uh, both the the GM and the and the the players roll dice to see what happens. Um, this this uh, current edition of Cults uh, uses the powered by the apocalypse system, which is far more, uh, I would say, narrative and much less impartial. Like it feels like much. It's not trying to be arbitrary it's very much acknowledging you guys we're all telling a story here and we're trying to find the most interesting story um can you talk about uh, that choice as it relates to the cosmology that you've described like and that horror nature of the game yeah i mean i i think that it's important to say that the first edition of cult was very traditional in a role-playing game sense that that it was you know the, what you expected you had your attributes and you had hundreds of skills and a lot of weapons and even some, even though some core elements were still there, it was much more like, oh, you have been, a, you know, given a mission, and then you go out and you storm a missile base and shoot some monsters. Uh, not, not all scenarios were that, but it, I think it was a child of its time. I think that the sort of the the setting and the ideas were very big and they were very new, but the sort of game systems and how you would play it wasn't really there. And I think that this is something that you more have discovered. Uh, 
and, and that's why we have this system for the new edition. I, I think it's important to note so also that in cult you can play, I mean, you play characters sort of archetypes that you sort of build and build upon, but you can also play, I mean, there are, there are really four types, four types of, of, uh, of uh, roles that you can play that are like, you can play sleeper characters and that's people that are, you know, trapped in the illusion. We, we, it's our world, basically. We don't see the supernatural and, and those kind of, um, uh, those kind of system uh, stories tends to be much more about, you know, you're playing a normal person and then you start to realize, you know, the sort of the first encounter, the first sort of glint of awakening when you start to realize, oh, wait, wait, something is not right here. Then you can play aware characters, and those are sort of the common player characters where you uh, where you have started to see the cracks in the cracks illusions. In the illusions. Uh, and and um, I think I hear myself now. No, it disappeared. Um, uh, well, well, it's more you know you have started to figure out that, that something is wrong, uh, and you can also sort of start to see into other existences. You can also play as enlightened, and then you really understand much about our prison. I would say you are perhaps a Gnostic, and you might even be practicing magic, and magic actually works because you have are so enlightened enough that you can actually actually affect the spiritual realm in such a sense that a ritual might have an actual effect in our world, while if you are a sleeper, the ritual will be, you can perform it, but the effect is clearly un uh, uncertain. And the last step is that you are awakened, but you can't play that because then you have sort of reached godhood. Then when you, you come to sort of the level of enlightenment, that's where the sort of the real journey towards awakening starts. And then it's more about, you know, unshackling self from the chains of the illusions, um, finding your own shadow and encountering that. And that's sort of a different avenue of play that are still a bit unexplored to us because normally you play as aware or sleepers. Um, I think I derailed actually uh, the question. I, I, I realized perhaps I can, I think you asked something else and then I just slipped away. <laughs> well, whatever you, what, what you answered was just as good or better. And this is, this is kind of the rant show, the show to go down rabbit holes, the show to explore things. So please feel free, you know, go off topic, uh, speak, uh, you know, get in there because what you were saying was was awesome. And yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I, I mean, I guess I need to start getting into these these cult games that we're running. So because uh, it's starting to sound like an engine for uh, exploring my own shadow and uh, hopefully ascension. Uh, but uh, Jason, what was your original question? Yes, what was it? <laughs> oh, wait, your sounds, your sounds oh, not working. Your sounds not working. Sorry. We've been having some sound problems. Jason, you may want to go back to your original setup or, or what have you. I, I think I remember that you asked something about the, the, diff, the change in system now uh, and and why it was. Uh, it also yeah, that, that's system. correct. Um, yeah, like the, uh, the, if, if, the, uh, if you can connect the choice of, the, of this system or even how the system is used with the theme of the game, um, uh, with that theme of, uh, of like say pushing against systems in a way yeah i i mean i would say that what, what i think that this system makes it's, it's actually the the strength of it is is that it's much more about the collaborative storytelling with the game master it's all about telling a story about these often very broken characters that start to realize something about their world uh, the world around them and that it is an illusion that there is, is it not the real world that there are things beyond our our uh, sort of understanding and that they themselves are more than they perceive and many of these stories and tragic because it's a horror game and we want to embrace that we we don't want this is not a game where you expect that you know the group together goes and fights the monsters then they get the xp and the loot and they go home and they level up it's more likely to be a very tragic story where some people perish. My, some might, you know, go on the journey towards enlightenment. It, it, we we rather go for the drama and sort of the tragedy, uh, and and sort of encourage that to play. We, we tend to say like play unsafe, dare to 
dare to fail, dare to you know explore your character's darker sides and have this good cooperation where the game master is not your enemy in that sense, but is a tool to tell these stories. That doesn't mean that you know you might get torn to pieces or 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 die in horrible ways, but it's it's uh, it's still sort of part of the the drama that we want to explore. And I think that the sort of search for truth and it's more of a narrative type of story and that the system itself sort of helps that kind of stories and whilst the other older cult system and, and similar systems often tends to get very bogged down in a lot of rules and cult even it's lost is very rules light it, it, it's very few roles you, you don't it, it's not about sort of you know now it's a combat and it takes two hours to finish a combat. It's not like that kind of game. Um, yeah, that's exactly the kind of the kind of answer I was hoping to get. The kind of kind of detail in terms of design and uh, and interaction. Um, have you heard actually from either experienced maybe as a as you've played the game yourself or seen games be played or uh, or heard feedback? back of games has has any of that impacted how you've seen um how you've seen the both the gnostic impression of the game or the gnostic uh inspiration of the game and how you the system is implementing it like i guess that that evolution of um of those choices as you've now seen the game go go live yeah well i i, I yes <laughs> we we are i mean we are we are right now working for example we are looking at we are, I mean, the, the cult is slowly expanding because right now the sort of the core rules is about playing, you know, sleepers and aware and characters, you know, those that have started to awaken. And we want to sort of also expand it to play, you know, enlightened characters. But it's hard to find a good balance to sort of what, because it's, I mean, you can do it in the sort of what is feels correct in a Gnostic way, but how do we create stories that feels interesting and how should these stories feel? As, and also when we come into magic, how will magic work in in, in this sense? So there are a lot of aspects of the game that we are still, you know, working with. And I think that cult is a first of all, it's a mythology and a setting where we have, uh, especially I who has written the setting chapters, are, have clearly decided to there are a number of things that are not answered, and that I don't know the answers to. It's like who was the demiurge? Where has he gone? Is he dead? It's one of them. Uh, why was the illusion created? I, there are things that I, I I have several theories, but I don't, you know, I, I want to have a lot of questions to players to explore and have their own views. And I think it's very clear that a lot of players, this is this is not strange, any case you can guess it, but a lot of the players that, that play cult are Many are Gnostics, many are interested in the occult, many are interested in religion. Of course, almost all, everyone li loves horror. And, and I know that, I mean, our editor, Jacqueline Brick, she, she sort of, her own Gnostic sort of uh, research yeah. comes from that you discovered cult, and she has sort of gone deeper in that than I have. So I think there is a lot of sort of, uh, you know, we, we, we are melding it together, and I think that in, in the world of cult, the minute it lost, it's sort of, this is the right kind of Gnostic. I guess it sort of is because we sort, of, we sort of define it like, oh, but this is sort of how it is in cult. So that in our world, we have a lot of theories, but in the game, this is how it is actually, uh, I guess. Uh, <coughs> uh, so, so um, yeah, the, now I ranted again in, in some strange direction. You can, you can uh, put me together in, in the right track. Oh, no, no, that was great. Um, uh, Jonathan, anything anything that's coming up for you? Uh, no, no, not really, but uh, I'm loving it. Keep keep the rants flowing. So, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I, I love that uh, that question of like the, the fact that the, the game and the the that the game is making you ask more questions, I think, um, and the creation of the game, the playing of the game, having you ask more questions. I, I really love that. Um, that process that it's like sort of there's a feedback loop between between art and and uh, art and soul art and art and um, uh, uh, the you know the 
uh, whatever the the real world or whatever it is that you're interacting with on a daily basis. I I appreciate that idea. Like it's something that Jonathan and I talked a lot about. Is that uh, there's a lot of art out there that might not be explicitly Gnostic or might not have been created by somebody who identifies themselves as Gnostic, uh, yet still carries that weight. So in this case, clearly there's been some Gnostic inspiration here. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, but I love that notion of the game cre continuing to give uh, a Gnostic questioning. Um, uh, I, I also I also think that you know the unknown is it fits very well for both horror and Gnosticism, or like any time where you want to. So I mean they they meld very well. Like you don't know this is the unknown. So it I mean it works very well for like what kind of horror might come from that as well. I think. Definitely. Um, as well as a, uh, you know, there, there's something even more terrifying and unsettling about the unknown, I think, right here, right now, not to always talk about how we live in special times, but the fact that we have these computers in our pockets, you know, you, you used to have long discussions where you'd just be like trying to figure out a fact or who won that hockey game or what was the name of that movie. Now we can know or think we can know everything with certainty, right? So obviously the unknown uh, in in both small ways and large ways, it, it has been both an inspiration and an existential terror for people. But in a society that says we all know, uh, you can we have solid answers to everything and you could look them up in a couple of seconds. I think psychologically there's perhaps something even more evocative when it comes to, to horror fiction when we're exploring this. Uh, as well as maybe it's lighter side in, in theological or religious speculations. But we, we do talk a lot on the show, you know, the, for the Gnostics out there, a, a lot of their first Gnostic experiences weren't positive ones, right? It wasn't, you know, angels coming down and visions of warmth and oneness, but, you know, experiences of uh, extreme terror, existential dread, alienation, and realizing that, that, that that, that this is a, a that we're broken divided beings in a broken and divided universe um uh jason yeah your next your next cue <laughs> no i i love it when you riff like that i think that's there's there's a lot there and i think um uh, i think jonathan you mentioned or no uh sorry Petra, you mentioned that notion of the the unknown being so so powerful and i think that is that's often the thing that lends that, that makes something terrifying is not, uh, it's not seeing the monster, it's seeing the silhouette of the monster, you know? <laughs> um, uh, it's hearing it, but not knowing what you're hearing. Um, and uh, and I, so, yeah, so I think like, I love that, um, that cult sort of enables that, uh, that process of questioning. Um, one thing actually, I, I wonder I, if we should maybe uh, go back a little on, I think like I, I did kind of do a brief sketch of how D and D generally works and how it's like trying to be an arbitrary game, uh, like a, a combat game in a lot of ways. Like as you mentioned, you might spend hours just fighting monsters in D and D or even Call of Cthulhu. Um, can you maybe give like uh, is there a, is there sort of a short way you can describe for our audience who might not know the difference um, what makes cults and that whole powered by the apocalypse system different? Uh, that notion of like moves is that a, is that a thing that you can synopsize quickly? Yes, I mean I I, I would say that in in um, in cult of Infinite lost you have uh, like your character you only have ten attributes it's it's they are shaped like the the Sephiroth of course and they're we also try to tie them so they are sort of logical sort of logical it's it's hard to get uh, the human in a in a, in a way that fits the game in any. So it works perfectly, but I think it, it, we got it quite right with with sort of the attributes. Um, the core in, in cult is that each role you make has quite a big impact. The one that leads the game, the game master, never rolls. You never roll dice. You never touch them. It's up to the players. You call to the players when they need to roll. It's up your decision and say like, uh, uh, roll, uh, act under pressure, which sort of is is your coolness attribute to see if you need to, uh, if you can act under pressure. And all the roles follow a very simple principles. You roll two 10-sided ten die, also 10-sided because we wanted to number of 10. So we had like the Sephiroth and Clifford in that. Uh, and add your attribute. And then there is clear level. So if you roll below nine or lower, it's a, con uh, it's a consequence if you roll uh, uh, up to 
14, it's it's uh, a consequence. Uh, yeah, it's a success, but with a consequence. And 15 or more, it's a it's a complete success. Uh, so it's all about sort of what drama creates the consequences. So uh, a, a combat scene or a chase scene that would make, take many roles in another normal combat system is quite quick in cult. We, we don't want it to be bogged down by by dice rolling. So uh in in cult for example if you uh, uh if you are hunted by something in a dark alleyway and it's raining and it's in a big city and you you don't know what is hunting you but you hear sort of the footsteps or is it footsteps behind you and there is this wall that you need to quickly climb over to get to the other side the the it's up to the game master to call is this actually worth a role is it dramatic enough to enforce that i mean you can say like oh you you get all over just in time uh, because it's all about the drama is it worth a role and then you have that role and you roll and if you uh, there is just a consequence it's up to the game master to say what the consequence is it, it does, doesn't need to be that oh you are you don't come over the wall but it might be yes you come over the wall but the creature is on top of you uh, and then you might, you know, succeed with a consequence. You you might succeed, and the consequence may be out, but you lose your cell phone, or someone sees you, or you are scratched on the back and you are wounded. And if you succeed completely, so it, it's very sort of leveled into sort of what kind of consequences does sort of the outcome uh, lead to. And we don't try to stay a long time with these roles. We we try to for, focus on the drama and the narrative. So, but each role instead have quite a lot of weight into it. I don't know if that, it's, it's really hard to describe game systems, I think, like verbally, but. but uh, it, it totally is. And I, I think uh, I think you've done a great job. That notion of, of it being about um, uh, consequences, for, uh, consequences that add to a story, essentially, uh, versus I think uh, what maybe I'll, I'll do the counterpoint of describing in, an, in a Dungeons and Dragons or a more, say, uh, traditional uh, role-playing game experience, it might be that if you wanted to, if you're running down an alleyway and wanted to climb over something, you would roll to see how fast you could run. You would roll to see if you could climb. You would roll to see how well you landed, <laughs> you know, and then if the monster attacked you, it would like roll against your defenses and it would roll how many hit points that it would it would take from you. So conceivably that same scene that uh, Petter just described could, could, could take say five or six rolls, whereas in the uh, the system that Cult uses, it could take only one. Um, uh, really kind of getting to the meat of, I think, what a lot of uh, a lot of these games are trying to get to, which is which is that moment of consequence and not necessarily simulating all of the steps. Um, uh, it's a it's a narrative enabler rather than a reality simulator. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, which is interesting to talk about reality simulators as we're also describing a universe that is extraction, but <laughs> um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so yeah, no, I think that was great. Um, so I've got uh, maybe uh, uh, w one more question that might take us into um, uh, into some other places here. Uh, it's, so it's, it, one thing that you mentioned is that like um, somebody who's uh, a Gnostic who is going through cult might be, or, a, or an occultist going through cult might be like, oh, hey, this is not the Kabbalah that I know. This is not the, this is not the, the, you know, the, the symbolism from the Valentinian uh, structure or anything like that. They might be like, oh, this is, they're taking a lot of liberties here. Um, uh, can, uh, can you, I guess, uh, I know you, you said this is, a, it's because it's a horror game, but I guess, can you get into what that process was of, of, both doing the research, re like seeing all of this stuff, and then um, making the making it cult. Like, how do I take the the the, the Sephiroth and make it cult? How do I take you know these things and make it cult? Um, what was that? What was that process like? Yes. Well, it it um, it was very interesting to dive deep into it and to try to to. To find a way how, how how is this going to be used but in in cult the sephiroth uh, is sort of the the foundation of of the illusion that we live in each each of the sephira like if you have like a, if each of the archons have a principle that goes 
like that it's represent an archon is of course like a, a, a power a will we, it, it's beyond us we can't we can't understand it in our sleeping forms what it is uh it's a part of the machinery it's a part of the illusion but each of these uh represents a principle so we have kether in in cult kether represents the principle of hierarchy hierarchy that influence you know all parts of our society and us so where where the influence of kether is strong also uh you know kether is strong so where you have hierarchies you have, your kether is that influence is strong and and uh, if you have bina in our in cult it's it's a community the sort of the gathering of people that when when you are sort of entrusting yourself to the community and with people bina becomes very strong and on the opposite of the cliff up uh, sort of their shadow side so uh, bina has satharial which is exclusion that is sort of when you have a lot of community that community will also exclude those that don't fit in and that sort of becomes the satarial's uh, principle and with Keter you have taumiel which has has sort of powers when you have hierarchy there are those that will try to break the hierarchy and climb in it so it's all about like this tug war between the 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 different parts of the sephiroth and the, the cliff up uh, and when you are sort of you know played cult a lot and you're planning scenarios and you are you're doing that you start to see the world from sort of a with the cult glasses on you can sort of see like ah here is a lot of uh you know tiferet is probably strong in that part of society because the allure of tiferet um you know is, is strong there so it when you're con constructing scenarios the different creatures and different aspects are are sort of tied to this but it's also tied back to to the illusion that entraps us because we are all we all have like hierarchy and community and all that sort of ingrained in us that sort of the 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 nature of reality and and about waking it up when it comes to waking up it's really to sort of see this and see the the sort of invisible threads we are like puppets on strings and, and trapped in that and see that what's which binds us and understand how we are bound and how we are trapped because when we understand it and we have the knowledge uh, we we can descend and that's also where sort of trauma and horror and insanity comes in because when we are in that state you know in these sort of dread and sublime we we can unconsciously break those chains for a moment at least because that the sort of the the, the feeling is so strong that we 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 forget the sort of the the illusion for a while that binds us and then we may see through the illusion and see what actually is there so when we are was working with sort of building the 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 like the the the, the archons and their principles and working with them i try to find first of all i try to sort of go back to okay what do they represent in different texts uh, i actually lean most to as a swedish occultist called uh, thomas Karlsson who wrote a book called sort of the gothic kabbalah uh, but he wrote and and i think it was he, he sort of it felt almost like like an occult role-playing game text in a way, but he wouldn't probably not agree about that. But I, I leaned a lot of, uh, on that. But it's then it was also to sort of, all right, how do we create the best setting for cult with the best scenarios and where sort of these principles can come into, uh, into form? And you will often find like these principles are like the themes of the different campaigns you are playing so that you know if you want sort of uh, a, a scenario where with a lot of hierarchy it's also tied to Keter in some way probably there are like servants of that archon or or Keter's influence is 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 coming over you so where you are in a place where an archon's influence is very strong it might overtake you and may sort of affect you uh, so so yes it was it was you know tried to be quite close but then it's like okay what does cult need as a horror game and and how do we create this interesting tug war that creates interesting stories where where we can have creatures and, and and magic and things affecting this and also that it feels like a nice blueprint of our reality because when you have the 10 separate and the 10 cliff up it's sort of what makes our existence but also what makes our souls i would say that is 
Cool. That is super cool. And I love the 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 note of like reading an actual local text, but feeling like it might be a role playing game text. <laughs> I think that's that's yeah. Um, I I have a I have a really like I I really had a, a strong reaction to what you said in, in a great way. Uh, but before again before I dive into it, Jonathan, is there anything that you want to mention? Anything that's coming for you? No, well, it's just it's funny when you when you're talking about reading an actual occult book and it, uh, you know, reading like a role playing book and and I and I hope I'm I'm articulating myself well here and not insulting anybody, uh, but it, it's it's very common to um, to be critical of the communities that Chase and I are in and uh, other communities and occultism and uh, modern Gnosticism as as LARPs as live action role playing games, um, but that said. <laughs> You know, it's 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 funny that that, that, that you know that 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 the Petter read this book, that you read this book uh, from from a Swedish occultist, and it reminded you of of the game playing because the you know drawing from the work of Alan Moore, like when he talks about occultism, it really is a kind of role playing, right? A, a conscious, creative uh, act of role playing, where on on one hand you do know that it's a game, the same way that the actor knows that they're in a play. Right now, they may be fully immersed in the character. They might be doing some, uh, some uh, the, what's it called, Jason? When you, uh, I should know this. My theater background, um, method, method acting. But at yeah. the end of the day, they don't. They know that they are an actor playing a play, right? So this this creative ritual creation role playing that is conscious and you know that you're doing it but you're doing it to engage with your imagination and through your imagination you engage with the forces of the universe so i, I think there actually is a connection that that is very powerful and direct between the game that you've designed and what people are doing when they do occultism. And I hope I'm not insulting any occultists out there. I think people are getting my point. <laughs> yeah, that, um, but yeah, this, that's all yeah. I have to say. I, I think that that's, uh, that's absolutely great, Jonathan. And I think like, I think you're right. Like um, when we, when we watch a movie or see a play or read a book um, and we are moved and inspired by fictional people, uh, that movement and inspire inspiration isn't fake because the characters didn't exist. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and I think relying too much on literality in terms of the, uh, in terms of the occult, uh, is probably a, a, a trap anyway, <laughs> at least in my opinion. Um, uh, but, um, and there's, there's other rabbit holes to go down there. I think the, uh, the, the other rabbit hole I wanted to dive down, I think that's also really interesting is one thing that I've, I've often said in, in groups that John and I are part of is that, um, uh, a lot like the systems that we're that a lot of us use and that a lot of us are, are, are excited by are ultimately themselves things that people have made to try to reach something that that people can't touch if that makes sense like it's it's trying to find words for a thing that is without words um uh and the reason i'm mentioning that is that, that i think what i think one thing that you talk about as you uh petra as you were getting into um uh looking at the sephiroth and like starting to see the world through the lens of those Sephiroth um, and how you can apply them in the in, within a game context is that I think there's also something really interesting there about acknowledging that if we are in a fallen world, uh, that even our constructions to try to help us climb out of them are not, um, cannot help but, but uh, have some of the grit and dirt in the world that we're trapped in, if that makes sense. So like, the system will be imperfect because it's being made within uh, within a world that is imperfect. If that makes sense, uh, it may get us it, like it may help get you out, but it itself is not the thing that is not the pure thing. Um, uh, I don't know if uh, if what I'm saying there makes sense. Um, can can someone let me know if that sounded crazy or not? <laughs> I don't think it sounds crazy. I, I think I, I I agree perfectly. I I also think that. The power, I mean, role-playing game is about storytelling and storytelling, I mean, you can have that in so many forms, but I think that that's what you want to reach is that, that you know, you want to awaken imagination. I think that's, that's core in cult. You want to, you, you want to sort of tantalize the mind with, with, with like, what if scenarios, what if the world, what if this, this uh, door leads to another place? What if in my dreams I can climb away what if you know there's a lot of what ifs and 
when you're playing and you have these really strong scenes and, and impactful stories, they they sort of linger with you and you remember them. And 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 I think it's also a way, especially since Cult is a very dark game, but you can also you can touch upon that shadow side of yourself in a very safe way and and actually go and explore a bit and do things that you you normally wouldn't do but but you can you know dress yourself in a very broken character a very immoral character perhaps even as long as you're safe within the group and we have a lot of in cult about like creating a horror contract setting rules for what you are okay with and and what not because we really want to sort of all the players should we agree that when we are playing cult these are lines that we might not want to cross and everyone has a say and we talk and it's a conversation of talking about them but if people are safe uh, and feel like we are okay with this then we 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 encourage people to dare to take the extra step to because a lot of horror is kind of safe you know it it's it often is i mean i would say i mean it often and i don't mean that you should just dive into gore but you should dare to go to like these places where you feel like oh now it's you know it's like if it's a movie you want to look look away or, or you're like oh no don't do that don't do that you can't do that you know you want to sort of go there and touch upon the dark and you know it was like a cathartic experience afterwards and i think that's itself i mean that's also one of the strengths of horror that you 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 go to a, a you touch so if, if it becomes really really well it's like a a, a I, I'm going to use a big word, but it's a sub, sub, it can be a sublime experience. And sublime, it's almost like, oh, that was wow. And almost like in a transcendental way, I would say. When it, it's at its best, I would say. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, it's just uh, the same thing with, with, uh, with art in general and the, the, uh, the immersion in imagination. It, it is, it's sublime, you know, it's, it's transformative and you, you lose yourself in it. Um, well, we are getting close to to an hour, probably close to wrap up time. Uh, but before before we start that process, before we start the goodbyes, which are always uh, sweet sorrows, uh, Jason, do you, do you have any closing questions to go out on? Um, yeah, I think. Uh, well, like, I think I also again I want to underline how how great that that idea was that the sort of that sublimity because I think that's also kind of what I'm talking about uh, regarding that inexpressible thing that art helps make space for a, for an inexpressible experience, much the same way that a lot of the esoteric practices, which might be considered a form of art or might be might be healthy to consider them a form of art, uh, create a space for the ineffable. Um, and maybe that that is actually my way into the, my last question. So one thing that you talked about was that like the horror nature of the game means that uh, uh, that is, there is sort of this doubling down on on how bad things are. Um, uh, and I appreciate that notion of what you were saying there about getting close to something that makes you uncomfortable and how to make sure people feel safe even as they approach that. Um, uh, now. Uh, you also talked about the notion of like characters going from sleepers to archetypes to eventually to awakened um, to to being fully enlightened, um, which is like maybe their escape from the horror game. Um, what, uh, uh, what maybe what would that look like? What what does that uh, like? Can you speculate maybe on what that uh, uh, end goal is of? Of cults, like what is that? What is that mystery that, that n nothing else can touch? And I'm basically asking you to describe the indescribable. <laughs> Thank you. You know those things that we don't answer. Uh, well, I I can say you this, and this might uh, this is also something we of course haven't said. It's like this because that would be uh, first of all, I would never want to define it. Uh, because I don't think you can define it. It's in the undefinable. And as soon as you define it, it sort of, uh, I mean, it becomes cheap. Because it's, as you said, it's defined from within a broken world. So the definition itself will be broken and dirty. But, and here I think is a thing that where, where cult sort of clashes with a lot of sort of core Gnostic ideas. It is that there are a lot of hints, some not that subtle, but some more subtle that uh, mankind as divine 
were perhaps that sympathetic because there are beings that exist in the universe of cult uh, that stems back from the time before mankind's imprisonment. And many of these beings have a very hateful stance against us. Um, and you could say, I mean, there is what, what happens when you become infinitely powerful and time and space doesn't really make, it, it doesn't bind you. How, how, what about morality? What, 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 what would you do? What would you do? What could you do? Uh, so I, I won't go into that and it's not defined that I, but it's, it's, let's say that when the illusion crumbles and mankind go back to its divine state, I think it's. It's not sure that it's necessarily for the rest of creation, so to speak, is a good thing. There are clearly forces in the universe of cult that don't want mankind to wake up because they either, you know, because what, what will happen then? And, 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 and as I said, the, the book alludes to a lot of this and it alludes to our also primordial home. It's one of sort of the, we can actually see like one of the sort of worlds where mankind once existed in our divine shape, which is now just like a dead ruin, but it, it, it still exists. And there are traces of that world was perhaps not the best place for everyone. So I would say that's probably something that Gnostic, I don't know if Gnosticism go there, that it's actually perhaps not for the rest of creation that good if mankind become enlightened. Uh, but cult asks that question. I mean, I, I mean, I could say that one, uh, hypothesis I have is that perhaps mankind actually created the illusion for itself. Perhaps, I don't know, but that's a theory I have in, in the world of cult. Amazing. Well, um, let me push the right buttons uh, here. Oh, I, I do maybe have one little bit of follow-up based on that, which I think is great, which is that, um, uh, I think again, so many really neat ideas there is that, uh, yeah, it's possible that a lot of Gnosticism as we discuss it and, and describe it is pretty like, uh, uh, uh anthro, anthrop anthropocentric, like human centric, uh, this assumption that, that humans are the, the, uh, uh, the, the sole, um, uh, uh characters in the drama. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the main characters in the drama, I think that's, it's, well, yeah, what is a Gnostic perspective that doesn't have humans as the center? I think that's really neat. Um, I don't even know the answer to that. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna dwell on that question. Um, so yeah, Jonathan, you can, you can start your, your goodbye process there. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, Petter, it, it's been amazing having you. And uh, if you could tell us again, I have him flashing your homepage up on the screen, but for those who are listening instead of watching, can you tell people where to, where they can find out more about Cult, where they can order it, and so where you are online? Yes, I mean, I think we have our homepage, cult, cultdivinitylost.com. I think it's important to say that we spell Cult with a K, Yes. instead of a C, it's, it's the Swedish spelling of the same word. So, so when if you just search for Google cult RPG, you might find something completely different if it's with a C, but if it's with a K, you will find the right one. Uh, we also have a, you know, a, a Facebook page, uh, Cult Divinity Lost. There is also a really good page called Cult RPG Fans with a lot of people in it. So if you, uh, on Facebook, and uh, we are on Twitter at Cult RPG as well. Uh, I also was thinking that we could have like a little, you know, lottery and, lot, you know, if someone wants to have a copy of the book, perhaps from one of the Patreon listeners or something, oh, I'm going to show something that no one has listened to, but we have this small Bible edition of Cult, mm -hmm. which is sort of uh, very handy, so you can bring it with you and it looks almost like a normal book, but uh, so you, people might not think that you are too weird, but it's the, it's, it's all the text of the core rules. And it's also have a PDF for the core rules if you want the artwork and stuff. Like that. So that can be like a nice thing to give away. Marvelous. Okay. Well, we will set up that that giveaway uh, uh, for the patrons. Thank you so much. So everybody, go to Cult Divinity Lost. Uh, Google Cult RPG, but, but make sure it's with a K. You may end up getting into finding something you don't want to find. Um, of course, uh, I already mentioned our Patreon. Again, I will mention uh, Twitch TV slash Gnostic Wisdom, where you can see our crew play Cult, working through an amazing scenario, a lot of fun. And uh, for my personal plugs, check out Myland Meditation. 
meditation.substack.com. I'm trained in secular meditation, in mindfulness-based stress reduction. Uh, that That's also what I sort of do as, as one of my side gigs um, uh, for, for employment. So I actually do this for free to get practice in meditation instruction uh, and meditating with people and what have you. So uh, it's every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. Uh, that's Eastern time, so the Montreal time zone, the New York City time zone, uh, etc. It's free. It doesn't matter if you have uh, beliefs or no beliefs. It doesn't matter if you've meditated before or haven't meditated. If you're interested in coming on out, just uh, uh, join us. Uh, and you can see the schedule and sign up at mylandmeditation.substack.com. Uh, Jason, jasonmemel.com. Anything else you want to tell people? Um, not too much. Uh, maybe, I, maybe I might mention that um, if you're listening to this and during the Calgary area before October 30th, we're going to be doing a, uh, we're going to be participating with the Law Heat House as part of their Halloween event with some um, uh, uh, creepy work inspired by the King in Yellow. Um, and um, yeah, just uh, sagetheater.com is where all the theater stuff that I do normally lives. And, um, oh, and maybe, yeah, just I'll underline there, if, uh, if you're not a patron of our Patreon yet and you join, I don't know, sometime soon, then, yeah, you can maybe be in that uh, in the lottery for the giveaway for that amazing book. Uh, if you're listening to this as a podcast, that book looked beautiful. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll put everybody who's in, uh, we'll, we'll give it a day or two so you can sign up, then we'll put everybody's name in a hat and we'll, we'll draw one. So, um, so uh, I hope, I hope you are, lis I hope you win. Whoever's listening to this, I hope you're the one. <laughs> okay, that's it. Thanks so much, everybody. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.